and welcome to IT Radio, IT Group's weekly podcast on the latest in cybersecurity technology, events, vulnerabilities, and threats. I'm your host, Alyssa Knight, and with me today is Scott Coleman, Director of Marketing and Product Management with OWL Cyber Defense. Scott joined the OWL team in 2014 and has over 30 years of experience working for high-tech B2B companies and MNCs as a software engineer leading, leading product management and marketing strategies. Why make trillions when we could make make billion a trillion is more than a billion all right zip it you know you can't even zip it zip look all ladies I'm... and gentlemen of the jury exhibit a number two would you please back look, me up i'm zippy long stockings <sighs> i can't when a problem comes along you must zip it Zip it good. Owl Cyber Defense is a manufacturer of data diodes, specifically a dual diode technology for interfacing between middleware and applications at the transport layer. Scott will be talking more about that himself, the company, and data diodes in general, and how diodes differ from network firewalls and access control lists. Scott, welcome to today's show. I have one simple request, and that is to have sharks with freaking laser beams attached to their heads. Now, evidently, my cycloptic colleague informs me that that can't be done. Uh, Can you remind me what I pay you people for? Honestly, throw me a bone here. Oh, hell, let's just do what we always do. Hijack some nuclear weapons and hold the world hostage. Thank you. So introduce yourself and Owl. Tell Tell our listeners who you are and what the company is and what the heck a data diode is. Sure. So um, I'm the uh, split my my time between product management and marketing here at at OWL. Uh, We've got a product management team that is managing our traditional critical infrastructure product line. Uh, We have a a, a gentleman focused on our the actual physical hardware because w- what we do is a hardware solution. We do have software layered on top of it, uh, but at the end of the day, you do get a box from us when you buy our product. Um, and then we have a product line that is focused strictly on our U.S. government uh, customers because of the special requirements that they have. Uh, we have to have a separate product line that cannot be exported, can only used by them um, because of the you know security that we're we're dealing with. So so that's the PM team. And then we've got a great marketing team here uh, who's working doing our promotions, our websites, our, our trade shows. We go to uh, this year we're actually doing 90 different trade shows, which oh my gosh. Like a crazy number, right? Um, but part of the reason that is is because we serve so many different verticals. Um, and as you right. can imagine, there is a bajillion cybersecurity shows going on. And, and so because we serve the nuclear industry and we su- support the Air Force and the Navy and water, wastewater, right? And then you've got your big shows like RSA and Black Hat, and things like that. So right. we go to the big shows because you get a larger audience and it's a wide variety of things. But then also when you've got, you know, an industrial control system, you know, cybersecurity specific show and you've got 200 engineers there all, all concerned about cybersecurity, you need to address them also. So, um, and then we've, we've got international, so we're, we're domestic, but we're also uh, strong in Europe, in the Middle East, in the Far East. So you've got regional shows there also. So um, for a small company or smallish company, uh, you know, we're not a Dell or a Cisco or something. Um, it's a lot on our plate, um, but it helps us get the word out. And we're still in that with data diodes is, is probably a lot of your listeners are probably not familiar with them. And we go to these shows and people, you know, are still getting familiar with data diodes and what they do, even though they've been around for 20 years. So a lot of what we focus in on is education and, and helping people learn what they are. And, you know, we've actually got an outreach program that we're doing with higher education. We're actually hosting Data Diode Day uh, in March. And we've oh, challenged cool. some, yeah, some, some college students to, to form teams and come back and compete with each other on how to best use Data Diode in, in terms of you know securing networks of the future and that kind of thing. So um, a lot guys- of what we do. Have you, have you guys, sorry, have you guys done anything around capture the flag events, sort of, you know, in that same vein of maybe, you know, having hackathons around people tr- attempting to breach or, or hack through your diodes? Yeah, so <laughs> that's a great question. It was actually the last podcast I was on, they asked the exact same question. <laughs> um, and 
we don't do that because we don't think it's fair um, because you can't actually hack the box. Um, and um, I mean, it's, it's proven technology. There's physically no way to hack the box. Yeah. yeah. I, I always thought, you know, it's a really interesting conversation to me because, you know, I know that uh, the cardinal sin, you know, committed by that can be committed by a vendor is to say that their product is unhackable. But I mean, with, <laughs> with, with data diodes there, there, there's literally what no send and receive wire. So there physically is no way for that send receive traffic to pass through it. So it's, 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 I, I would imagine it would be a very short hackathon. Yeah, ex- exactly right. There wouldn't be much, uh, much to it. Uh, you'd have some frustrated people, you know, sort of giving up on things. You know, the only, um, it, cause we, we've had, you know, companies like rapid seven and stuff and multiple uh, national labs, uh, if you're familiar with like Sandia National Labs and, sure. and folks like that, actually tested the box and, and proven there's no way to do it. So, you know, like I said, it, we didn't think it would be fair to uh, to try and uh, people are always up for the challenge, but uh, <laughs> but like you said, it would be a short lived sort of effort. So, what the data diode is actually more around is how well does your team understand the technology. We do think might be some interesting or new ways or applications to use it. What is sort of the business justification? We're hoping it's actually going to be a mixture of engineering, IT, um, and potentially some of the business majors working together as a team to think about the product, the technology, and how it might go to market and serve people. So um, that's the uh, that's the essence of it. We haven't released the actual prompt yet, um, but uh, that's that's what we're shooting for. Can you, for for our listeners who uh, aren't f- quite familiar with what a data diode is, or the distinction between a data diode and you know them using, for example, a firewall or access control list, what 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 is the difference between a diode and a firewall? What what is a data diode in general? Yeah, sure. So lots of times we're we're at these trade shows we go to, and I can pick out the you know the guys that come up with the double E's because they'll say, okay, I know what a diode is, so I'm assuming a data diode is something only that's data go in one direction. I said you got it exactly correct. So okay. it's is a group of hardware um, components uh, that end up creating a one way only physical connection and. So in in the diode inside the data diode, uh, we have normal things like CPUs and hard drives and memory and that kind of thing. Uh, and each diode has two sides. We have the secure side, which is you know whatever it is protecting. So whether it's a nuclear power plant or a turbine, you know, or a data center for a bank or whatever it is, uh, that's the secured side. Uh, you have the other side, the receive side, um, which is facing you know maybe company headquarters or just out to the internet or out to the cloud or whatever it is that you're, you're need to move data to. And on the send side, uh, it comes down to basically the, the core, the essence is, is there's an led there shining light over a fiber optic cable. Um, so that light is, is basically data moving as, as over, uh, over that fiber. On the receive side of that fiber is a photoreceiver that takes that light, transfers it back to electronic or electric signals um, to move through the regular CPUs and all the other equipment uh, that, it, that process traffic and data. On the receiving side, there is no LED to send light back over that fiber cable, and there's no photoreceiver on the receive side of that, the send side, the original side that's protected side, to actually receive the data or the huh. light. So you it literally can only send light in one direction. We actually did a little video earlier, probably two months ago now, where we, we actually have a couple of our folks explaining how diodes work. One's holding a flashlight and we shine the light through a piece of glass to a photoreceiver, a battery basically charger, um, and illustrating the fact that, yeah, you've, you've got the light moving, but there's no flashlight to send light back. There's no you know, photoreceiver on the inside to receive that light back. You can't, you know, so there's no malware you can install that's going to spontaneously create create that light. (laughs) The the components aren't there, right? So you can't, it's not a version. There's no bug. There's no, you know, there's nothing there that you can do or invoke. You can steal the credentials 
of the user on the on the on the internet side, but you still can't use it go across. We've actually separated on the diode. You can see everything is separated. Each side has its own CPU. Each side has its own power supply. Each side has its own hard drive. Each side has its own power connection. You need to administer each side through its own RJ45 jack. Right? There's literally nothing connecting the two sides except for that fiber cable with the LED on one side and the photo receiver on the other side. So even if you stole the credentials or compromised the credentials and got you onto the box, it can't you get you into the network because there's no way to get you know across the box into the network. And and that's really the difference, you know, sort of alluding to between that and a firewall. A firewall, you think about it is right software controlled rules um, that are right. configured. Yeah, right? that, that and humans are the weakest link in security. So historically, <laughs> exactly. that's what, to be honest, most of the fails in firewalls is because someone created a rule the wrong way, or someone created a rule and forgot about it and forgot to remove it. It's it's you know it's driven by rules. So you know when you have something like you know an owl data diode, there, there are no rules to mess up. There's right. no rules to forget about. Exactly, and it, and it goes to um, both the um, complexity of setting up those because that's where the, the human failure sort of enters, right? Where you forget something or you do something and you didn't mean to or it's unintentional or intentional, right? It could be both. Um, and over time, because the diode, the rules are in the hardware, you actually, it may, it's less maintenance and upkeep over time because you're not having to go in and, and update the rules and configuration. And it's, it's really one of those sort of set it and forget it kinds of environments. I've you know, been in multiple shows where a customer will walk up and say, oh yeah, we've got your stuff and we haven't touched it in two years and I had to go find the little sticky pad that had the password on it so we could get in to, to make our change or whatever. So um, it really is a box that once it's up and running and you know what data you need to move, uh, it can just, it does its job and it just uh, continues to move data for you. Keep me honest here, but I believe that firewalls are on the OSI model layer three through layer seven devices, especially with UTMs and protocol decoding and deep packet inspection, all that fun stuff. With data diodes, would it be fair to say that or accurate to say that they are layer one devices then, especially since you're talking about that light not being there for traffic flowing in the opposite direction? Would it be a layer one security device it's i mean it's a it's, a, it's actually a mixture um okay. because it, it's some it's some in some ways you're at that physical layer absolutely right and when we take you know rj45 you know in ethernet in for the most part um is the the physical connection and uh, but we do support tcp ip and udp and I was just about to say, yeah because i mean it, it right. does the cisos do need to be concerned about what protocols the diodes right. right so it's even though it's a layer one device it, there is also some protocol dependence there there is the and one. right and and i referenced before that we have cpus and hard drives and, and the reason and the reason it's a data diode and not just a diode uh, is because we do have to handle those protocols. And because lots of people think is, okay, I get the one way thing. So if I'm pushing an image or a file across it, I, I get that. But geez, most of my network traffic is all TCP IP and it's all two way. And that's not going to work with a diode. And, and therefore this must be a really limited application. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so the answer to that is no, uh, because what we do is we actually have proxies that we run on both sides of the diode. And that's what the oh. reason for the CPUs are, right? So let's say you and I are communicating via TCP IP. Um, and now we say, well, that's great, but it's not very secure. How do we put a diode in between our conversations, right? So what happens is um, instead of me talking to you directly, I'm now going to talk to the diode. Now, as an application, I may not know. I'm just my I, I, I'm now talking to a new IP address, right, kind of thing. Um, I don't know that I'm no longer talking to you. I'm talking to the proxy on the diode. And so the proxy accepts the, the packets, does the acts, the NACs, all the normal flow control, all that kind of stuff. So I'm still sending my data. And I'm happy because I'm, I'm doing my normal application stuff. And, and therefore, I don't know that I'm talking to the diode. The diode, what we then do, part of the things we do um, is 
we don't actually move the whole packet across the diode. Uh, so that's another difference between a firewall and what we do is in a firewall where you're going to open up holes or pinholes and that kind of stuff. But you're actually packing, passing the whole packet through as is. We actually strip off all the header information, all the IP, all the routing information, all that. And we just take the payload and we actually use ATM across. So that, that fiber that's going across is actually processing uh, data as, as ATM. Um, we use ATM because it was a one-way protocol built by the phone companies years ago for high bandwidth, low latency, one-way data traffic. So if you're doing your voice and imaging and stuff on a phone, right, you can't acknowledge every packet. You start introducing jitter and latency and all kinds of stuff, which is not sustainable in a phone network. Right. So we took in, we've taken in a one-way protocol, ATM, you know, but it's a push, and we just moved the payload across. And of course, we're going about all of eight inches, you know, so there's no routing being done on the, on the diode. Uh, there's no switching, there's no routers, there's no anything. It's a point to point connection across that fiber. Um, so it means we can move extremely fast and extremely reliable because there's no network congestion or there was no contention on the network. Right? It's just us pushing our packets across as fast as we can go. So our latency is typically about six milliseconds, right? So it's oh, wow. extremely fast. Um, and so, you know, to the human eye, we could run five streams of video simultaneously and you will not be able to see any kind of latency there. So the proxy is taking that data, terminating the TCP IP session, X and X, flow control, all that stuff. Now it's just taking the payload out, sticking it um, into the ATM channel across the diode. And the other side, it pulls it back out and says, oh, I got a payload coming in on channel three. And, oh, that's mapped to IP address XYZ, which happens to be your you know, IP address like you originally, um, repackages it at TCP IP, puts the payload back in and shoots it up. So now you, as the, as the original recipient, you're receiving your TCP IP traffic instead of receiving it from me directly. I've gone to a proxy across the diode one way, back into TCP IP format and off to you, and you're getting everything you expect, right? So now we've got a TCP IP um, on either end, but you've got a one-way data transfer in the middle. Um, so that A, it's breaking the protocol, right? So there's a protocol break in there because I'm no longer TCP IP or UDP or FTP or whatever the original protocol is. I've converted it all to ATM. So anything that's embedded potentially in the packets is stripped out because we're just moving the payload and then reassembled on the other side. So it adds another layer of, of of security there. And none of the IP address and port information, none of the routing information inside the network is ever exposed on the outside like you would on a firewall because we never, we don't move the whole packet. So all of that information about the network stays inside the network and is never exposed on the outside. So there's a, a, a number of sort of layers of things going on, uh, but the proxies is how we handle, that's how we can appear in the network just like any other network device and not sort of disrupt normal flows of information. Now, there is things that more at the higher level, uh, sort of back to your sort of OSI model, um, where there's application layer stuff that needs to get done uh, that's not handled just at like a TCP IP level. And we do have additional connectors or interfaces that we've written to support specific application layer acknowledgements so that we would then take, so let's say it's a server client server architecture, you know, we become, we take on the, the persona of a client, we get the information off the server, we move it across the diode, and then we take on the persona of the server on the other side, and then that client that was re originally getting it, and, and we do that. So we've, we've written a number of those kinds of connectors where we found um, that just sort of working at a UDP or TCP IP level is not working because there is some kind of application uh, dependencies there. And we'll handle those uh, by becoming our own server and client on either side to do that. A, so, a sort of legitimate man in the middle attack. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, sort of. Exactly. Right. We're 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 the yeah. You know, we become the new source, right, of information. Sure. Exactly, and we push it across. Yeah. So you're each of those is is working in its own domain. You know, connected across the the diode. But yes, we are sort of handling that uh, that translation in the middle. With that being said, how many protocols does Owl support? I mean, obviously, it supports the the SCADA protocols like the Modbus and other protocols. What? How many protocols do you guys support currently? I mean, that's a good, we, yeah. So there's, um, hmm, there's a bunch of different ones. There's, you know, like there's things like there's historians. Um, if, if you and your listeners are familiar, that's, those are specialized databases within industrial control systems. Right. Um, 
where they collect, you know, time synchronous data. Um, so we support a bunch of different those, like there's a Wonderware, uh, this owned by Schneider Electric, and there's a OSI Soft, um, their Pi Historian, which is the sort of 800 pound gorilla in that space. And then you've got uh, Rockwell's like factory talk and stuff. So you've got a bunch of number of those kinds of historians things. So there may be not so much that they're protocols, but they're um, tools and products that exist that you need to interface and support. And then you have things like OPC and Modbus that you mentioned right. and IEC 104 and DNP3. Um, so there's a whole sort of host of in each industry. So like DNP3 and IEC 104, that's really for power distribution and transmission. That's where they, those protocols come to play. OPC is more on your SCADA stuff where it's where straight SCADA. So there's a number of things that are that are vertical and sort of industry specific. So we've had to adopt to a bunch of those different things um, to be able to support those, um, you know, across, you know, our customer base. One of the things that I've been involved in are conversations in within PCI, the PCI domain around, you know, the, the potential to replace firewalls, controlling traffic into a cardholder data environment from the corporate zone or even from a PCI in scope zone. What is your experience been with CSOs implementing, implementing diodes to protect a cardholder data environment? So not, not, not CSOs who are protecting a, an industrial control system network or a nuclear power plant, but possibly a, a PCI network. Uh, you know, the targets of the world separating the HVAC systems and, you know, the, their, their suppliers, their air conditioning and, and HVAC suppliers from their, their point of sale systems with data diodes. Is, is that possible or is, is the, to the real only application of diodes just industrial control systems? Yeah. So that's a, that's a fantastic question because, um, you know, that was, you know, the industrial control systems and well, before that, I mean, our history is, you know, 20 years ago when we started the company was, is, was all around the military, um, the Department of Defense, the intelligence agencies, you know, which, which were all using this, this technology. Um, and then moving into um, some big breaches that happened in the Middle East um, against the oil producing companies there. And that's really where the market demand pulled us into industrial control systems. But the use cases are the same across industries. And so you bring it up, you brought up the target thing, or you can talk about Equifax, right? That, that happens. Right. Stuff. And it's really all about segmentation and making sure that people only have access. So, so the guys, right. So unfortunately target was relying on how the cybersecurity practices of their HVAC, you know, company uh, to protect their point of sale stuff, right? I mean, that, that's the chain there. It's that lateral movement. So somebody hacks the HVA system, you know, company, which has legitimate reason to get to the stores, you know, because they had to manage um, the HVAC systems. But, geez, there sh never should have been a, a, a way to get from there into point of sale or whatever, however they traverse the network to get into the, you know, the information for credit cards and all that. So, yeah, there should have been absolute diode sitting there right at the edge. Yep, you can get to, you know, you could send stuff out of corporate uh, to HVAC, or maybe there's multiple HVA systems across the store or something, a building, and they need some kind of common bus or something. But that should have all been pushed through a diode to an external point that the HVAC vendor could access to get its data. And you see that, you hear that kind of uh, use case over and over again. You just change the names of who's doing what, right? So you have that a turbine. So uh, GE um, with their OSM products, right? They have in Atlanta, they do a lot of their centralized monitoring of the turbines that they've got deployed around the world through their facility. Well, the operators of the turbines don't want every vendor reaching into their network, into their operations to pull that data out. So, right. you know, gee, put the a data dial by the turbine. Well, if I'm a bank and I got to print my statements, you know, and send it out to my customers, well, do I need my print vendor to reach into me to get information that I need to put on my statements? No. Why don't I build a file, push it across the diode to that print vendor, you know, my statement, whoever's providing my statements and doing the mailings, right? And I send it to them. I push that data to them. Uh, what if I've got a data center and I need to tell somebody, my support folks on the outside that um, 
that there's been an alarm, that a hard drive has failed inside that data center without having to have someone physically in that data center 24-7. Well, I could send that across the diode out to uh, my main, main, I could send it as an email um, and CC the whole team or whatever, and they all get the alerts that, that's going on. So it's it's that same scenario over and over again. Um, I've got information inside something that's secure. I want to share it with people on the outside, um, but I don't necessarily need to open up my doors and let people come in. Even if it's a, you know, in the, in the terms of a firewall, a pinhole, right? Well, a, a, a hole is a hole, right? And the bad guy doesn't care if it's a pinhole or a gaping hole. Right. It's, gonna, it's, a, it's a point of entry, right? And so if you can do that, if I can share data with my vendors, with my support personnel, with HQ, because they want to know about production information, or I got to report that maybe I'm a pharmaceutical pharmaceutical uh, entity and I need to share batch numbers and all kinds of information like that with the government, you know, and, and, and so government regulatory things, um, all that information can be shared across the diode. So it's there, the use case remains very, very similar. It's just, what is it, is it going to a printing company, a different, you know, banking statements? Is it going to, you know, uh, GE's, you know, facility in Atlanta to, to monitor there. Is it information coming off an oil rig that's going back to uh, the operator to, so they understand what's happening, you know, on the seismic layer below the seafloor, below the rig? You know, um, there was, there's, uh, you know, a lot of things that, that have happened recently that uh, could have been prevented if people had felt secure about moving data and getting it back to some kind of centralized monitoring. And that, and that's just increasing uh, every single day. So if you think about one of the areas we're looking at, you know, we think are, are obvious places that people need to protect is you've got factories with robots and things that are in there and you've got third parties that are going to maintain those robots and you don't want people going in there. I, I'm just waiting for somebody to go in, hack a robot and have it, you know, stamp out Scott was here on the fender of the next floor and you know, roll <laughs> off the line or something, right? Just Even if it's just for fun, right? Um, but, but somebody's, you know, managing that and all that's being pushed to the cloud, right? And in the cloud, you've got all these great analytics tools and dashboards and all this stuff. And, you know, what's my next time that I need to perform maintenance on this unit because it's been operating for so many hours or so many days or whatever at certain RPMs and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and all that's being pushed to the cloud, which makes sense. So they, it can be managed remotely. Um, but how do you securely move that? Well, push it through a diode out to the cloud. Right now you've got it in a central place, but you've no, you haven't opened up your protected facility uh, for, for additional vulnerability. So it's the, it's the same use cases over and over again, um, and it really just depends on, on what the source of the data is and who the consumer of the data is. So a CISO is planning for the implementation of a diode. Final question here, how should that CSO plan for the implementation? I mean, one of the things that I, I'm always talking about is the, the fact that organizations need to understand the direction of the data that's being transmitted between their systems and applications, understanding not just the directionality, but the protocols, you know, what ports are being used by those applications, what need to be open, what don't. Because I, I think historically, security administrators, security engineers had this, you know, adopted this concept that let's just look, we don't know what protocol, we don't know what protocols these apps use, we don't know what ports they're using, let's just open it all up. You know, let these systems talk to each other. It's on the same internal network anyway. It doesn't matter. Just let them talk over any port protocol. I think we're getting away from that at this point and moving more towards segmentation, micro segmentation, that sort of thing. We talked a little bit about that with Target and some of these other breaches that have occurred. And there is definitely a need for secure network architecture through isolation, network isolation. If, if a CIS is planning for the implementation of a diet, what are the things they need to be thinking about? Obviously, I think one, one of the biggest answers to that is understanding the directionality and ports and protocols that, that their data, uh, that their applications are using. What are some of the other things that they need to prepare for? Yeah, so I think it's exactly what you're talking about is who needs to who needs to get data from whom, right? And 
is it something that I can push to you rather than you reaching? One of the things we talk about is if I got 14 vendors out there, 14 connections, maybe I can't put them all into, you know, through a data diode um, because again, data diodes aren't going to solve every single problem. Sure. Um, but if I can go from 14 down to three, you know, so maybe 11 of those can be one way pushes of data out. And then I just got to heavily manage the three remaining ones that have to be two way because of, for whatever, you know, a whole bunch of a host of reasons, I can never get rid of all of them. Um, but if I can reduce that, that sort of footprint so that I only got three that I have to manage, and then I can really apply a lot of really good intrusion detection stuff against those and look for insider threats and all those kinds of things, that's, which, which are still relevant. That's sort of your first thing. Who can I push data to and push it through a diode? And how do I segment uh, to make sure they get what they need? You do have to pay attention to protocols just to make sure the stuff is supported. And that there isn't some kind of application layer handshake going on that you need to, that needs to be persistent or maybe can be replaced with something. Um, you need to think about bandwidth, how much data you're going to move across. So a lot of our applications, it's very small amounts of data. So if you think about uh, maybe like a, a wind farm or something, there's not a ton of data generating there, but there is a lot of data coming out of like a refinery um, or maybe you're doing vibration testing or something where there's large, you know, they're actually shaking the ground and they're, they're reporting back seismic things. So think about your bandwidth. Um, and then I guess probably uh, the last thing is how are people going to sort of the human element of that is, well, I always run this report and I get, you know, I log into this database and I pull this out. Well, okay. Can we automate that report? Um, and we have a bunch of customers done this. They've automated the report and it just becomes a push of a file or a PDF or whatever out to you still get in your report. So, so don't, you can't sort of ignore the human element of people who have always done something a certain way. And, and now they just have to understand is, you know what, instead of you having the call up and, and run the report, it's going to land in your inbox every day for you automatically and things like that. So those are, those are probably the ones that you sort of start out with and thinking about and planning, you know, where these things to make most sense and, and how you do your, your segmentation or your micro segmentation. Oh, okay. So how, how are users actually using the application, the actual, yeah. the actual, like you said, the actual case study or use case? Yep. Yes. We, we're huge on use cases. We've, we've published a bunch of them on our website so people can start to think about that. I mean, we, we try and show the before and after. Before they were doing this in this way, but there was this vulnerability. Afterwards, they're now doing it this way and we've, you know, we secured that vulnerability kind of thing. So use cases are, are huge. We're always asking customers, you know, what their use case is and how. And we usually start out with the, the simpler, easier ones. So, so rather than going into a bank and say, well, we're going to secure all your SWIFT transactions and all your reconciliations. No, 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 that's, that's not where you start. You start with, I need to get invoices printed. I'm doing a disaster recovery and I need to push an image out to my repository once a day, or I need to send something out to all my branches once a day, right? Well, instead of having that being in a vulnerability, you know, send stuff through a diode. So you think about the where it's, it's obvious that you can do your connections first, and then you move closer and closer to that core. Um, but yeah, start at the edge first. Well, that's awesome. You know, Scott, it was a real pleasure speaking to you today. We're really excited about what you and Al are doing over there with, with this area of technology. And I, I think there's a lot of education that needs to happen within the marketplace about data diodes. And the, I think this, this misperception that data diodes really are just for industrial control system security. So ITaker will be releasing some research soon on uh, our cyber defense on data diodes and we'll have some reports coming out soon as long as well as a case study with you guys so i'm excited about that don't mess with me i'm one crazy mofo i had to pop a cop because he wasn't giving me my props in oaktown you know i heard that somewhere so we we wish you a lot of luck and and uh, uh continue doing what you guys are doing over there and and we look forward to partnering with you to help you in doing that yeah thank you for uh, inviting us i enjoyed sharing the, some information with you today Awesome. Thank you, Scott.